Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Global Climate Emergency Panel, generously sponsored by Country Food and part of the Country Festival Science Section. The panel discussion forms part of a week of activity organised by the Country Climate Action Partnership, which will culminate in the Westgate Hall on Friday with a rally, taking together all the everything that's happened during the week. Um, and then representatives of the um, Canter Climate Action Partnership will be going to COP26 and taking the findings there with them. So it's all very exciting. Um, there will be a Q&A through this and there will be roving mics. My colleagues will hand them to you. And now it's a great pleasure to hand over to the Chair of the Canter Climate Action Panel and Secretary General and Emeritus of the Commonwealth Local Government Forum, Dr. Carl Wright, who will introduce the panel and will chair tonight's discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Emma, and uh, welcome everybody and good evening, and great to see you such a good audience on a Monday evening. And let me start off really by thanking um, very much Amanda and the team at uh, the festival who do a tremendous job, I think, not just on this event, but all the events in the last uh, week or so. Uh, and of course, also uh, Lisa Carlson and her team who's with us, who's been tremendously supportive in all the work we've been doing with the, what's actually the first ever Canterbury Climate Action Week. Um, many years ago, in my, my Commonwealth capacity, I, I was very privileged to meet Nelson Mandela. And uh, he was somebody, of course, a great hero of mine. And some of you may have heard this particular uh, quote, which was something he, he said uh, on a number of occasions. He said that when you climb a great hill, you climb a great hill, you then find at the top of the hill, there are many more hills to climb. And I was thinking about COP26. Now, there must have been 25 COPs. So we've had 25 hills already. We've got another one to climb in Glasgow. So let's hope there's not too many more after that, because clearly we must have some conclusive action if the current global climate emergency is, is going to be overcome. And I think that is something we're going to address this evening uh, with, I think, a very distinguished panel. And let me just quickly introduce everybody. Um, Lucy Slack, who is the, the, the current Secretary General of the Commonwealth Local Government Forum, which is an organization that brings together local governments, cities, mayors, elected politicians across the world, but also central governments, uh, central government ministries responsible for, for local government. Uh, and Lucy uh, has been in that role for, for many years, uh, very experienced on work internationally on climate, other areas, um, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and sits on a number of broader global panels. And the organization has offices in Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and the Pacific. So I'm sure she'll bring in some of that wider international dimension to our discussion, because clearly, as with COVID, climate doesn't know boundaries. We're not only talking about the country or the UK. Secondly, probably no need for introduction, um, Dan Watkins, who is the uh, councillor Dan Watkins, who is the lead councillor for Canterbury City Council on climate, has been tremendously engaged in, in climate issues um, since the council declared a climate emergency, has been very supportive of the work of CCAP, our, our climate action partnership here, and among other things is also a very avid bicyclist and bicycle champion, I think, Dan, aren't you? Um, and that, in a sense, makes it very relevant that in addition to his city council role, he's also a member of KCC, Kent County Council, and deputy member of the transport section. So I hope you're promoting bicycling there, Dan. Good, good. Um, which brings me to William Rowlandson. Now, it's not Rosie Duffield, um, uh, unfortunately. Um, we're privileged to have William, but Rosie has sent her apologies at the very last minute. And I, I, I do apologize to people who are here to listen to her. Uh, but we only learned yesterday that she has to attend a three-line whip vote in Parliament, which unfortunately what happens with MPs, and so she has sent her very sincere apologies. We're hoping she's going to be with us at the Westgate Hall rally on Friday. Uh, but very kindly, William has jumped in, and I think he's a very eminent replacement. Um, not only is he the vice chair of the Country Climate Action Partnership, CCAP, uh, but he's also um, on the um, University of Kent Environmental Management Services, and he's a sustainability <coughs> champion at the university where he also lectures. So I think William will you know, be a very eminent, eminent stand-in. And last but not least, um, it's good to see a young face amongst us, uh, Ella Scar, 
who is um, actually at Langton Boys School, and they do have girls at Langton Boys School, <laughs> uh, with women, young, young women, and uh, young students, uh, where she's doing maths, physics, and chemistry, A-levels, I think this year, but perhaps more, more relevantly to our discussion tonight, she holds um, a, a very significant position uh, at the county council level, where in fact she is the um, chair of the Kent Youth County Council Environmental Group, campaign group, and she's also on the UK Youth Parliament, so I'm sure she'll give us a bit of the um, voice of not just youth, but I think the, the generation that's really going to be affected by, by climate change uh, in the coming years, unless we do something about it. And that's really our job tonight, is to, to address those issues. Now, what I want to do tonight is to make this a very participatory event. We've told the, the panel they're not going to make any speeches, they're not going to make any formal statements, maybe some summing up at the end, but we want you, the audience here, to really come in to ask questions, to give suggestions, to give ideas. And because this is part of the Canterbury Climate Action Week activities, uh, what your suggestions are, are going to be given tonight are going to be fed into our discussions, fed into what comes out of our conclusions, we hope, on Friday, which, as was already mentioned by Emma, uh, a small group of us will be going up to COP and taking the messages from Canterbury up to the COP conference. Uh, we're going to uh, interact with all the partners and stakeholders there, and we'll have a chance, hopefully, to learn from some of the lessons, not just from across the UK, where I think there's some great things happening in places like Bristol and elsewhere, but also from around the world. And I think that is going to be a really amazing experience, we hope, and we'll be reporting back, of course, uh, to, to um, everybody when we, when we return. Um, perhaps just one final point before I open up the discussion. Um, if you haven't seen the uh, website um, of CCAP, um, www.ccap.org.uk, um, please visit it. Um, A, to see what's happening this week. There's more details of times and there's a tremendous program tomorrow, for example, at, uh, at Canterbury College, where lots of community groups from across the district are exhibiting, are doing talks, are doing all sorts of interesting things in the afternoon. Uh, Wednesday, we've got the business uh, groups meeting up. Thursday, there's more university things going on. And of course, other things are happening as well. There's a fair trade event at the weekend and the, the Westgate Hall rally. So please have a look at the website. Have a look at the website. Also, what we're going to be doing next year, because we want you to get engaged in our organization. We want you involved. We want you to support your ideas. Um, if you're feeling generous, there's a crowdfunding appeal to help support our activities. They're all voluntary. We don't have any staff. We don't have any money much. <laughs> so, you know, we, we do need your support and help as we progress. But that's another plug. Let, let's get going. And um, what I'd like to do, like on question time, we're going to pose a number of questions to the panel and then ask you, the audience, to come in. And also, we hope, you know, for you to ask questions and ideas. So I'll kick off with the first question, which is really a recognition that today has been a focus on what the local government can do to address climate change. Uh, Nicholas, first thing here, the climate officer, was at the Beanie all day, uh, talking to many members of the public. And what I'd like to really ask the panel, um, perhaps particularly Dan and Lucy, but others as well, is what is the, the role of local government in addressing climate change? Why do we need action at local level as opposed to the level of national government? And why is this important? Um, so, who'd like to kick off? Dan, maybe? Go on then. Um, well, welcome everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting all of us to uh, talk to you tonight. And uh, looking forward to a very interactive discussion. And um, yeah, this is the, the, the number one topic uh, for the next uh, month or so uh, climate change with, with uh, uh, COP26 coming up. And um, yeah, I'm delighted that uh, you've shown your interest in it locally to, to come out today. I think, um, you know, Carl is right, a, a huge amount of the challenge that is climate change is gonna be addressed by uh, governments uh, from every country in the world. Um, but local government has to act as well, um, really to be the uh, sort of counterpoint to national government, because at the end of the day, local governments are that much more in touch with their communities. Um, we are the people who have uh, carbon generating assets on the ground. We have the swimming pools, we have the social housing, we have the car parks, we have 
the uh, municipal buildings, all of which have a carbon footprint and all of which have an impact upon how, as individuals and as businesses, we all, we all behave. You know, here in our district in Canterbury, uh, every choice we make has a carbon footprint and so uh, all local strands of local government do need to be uh, firstly putting their house in order. So at Canterbury Council we declared a climate emergency two years ago as, as, as Carl said, that's when I was appointed in my role. Um, and you know, we have set our own target of being carbon neutral by 2030. So we've only, we've only got nine years left. Um, there's lots of challenges to make, but we believe that we should be showing that leadership and trying to get to that target uh, sooner than the country as a whole. So we're hopefully going to uh, achieve that as we cut the, the carbon from our various um, activities. But also, as I say, we need to show leadership to residents, community groups, families and businesses in our area so that they know the green choices that they can make to reduce their own carbon footprint so that uh, as a district we, we go to carbon neutral as soon as we can. And, and yeah, nationally the target is 2050, but we just decided last week as a council uh, that we're going to now um, put it through our internal kind of committees to bring forward the Canterbury uh, district target to 2045. So, we're now looking to be even more ambitious and keep Canterbury at the front of local government in terms of setting a, a really ambitious target to mean that uh, in 24 years' time, rather than 29 years' time, uh, we will produce no more carbon pollution in our area. Very good. Lizzie. Thanks, Carl, and thanks everyone for having me down. And obviously I'm giving a little bit of a sort of broader perspective. I'm not so familiar with the details of everything that's happening here in Canterbury, but I hope I can bring a little bit from what's happening in local government in other parts of the world. And I think I would firstly agree with, you know, everything that you've just said, Dan, in terms of the sort of leadership role of local government. And I think when we look at climate change, we realise that it's no one sector, whether that's local government, whether that's the private sector, whether that's uh, business, it doesn't, it's not one sector that's going to solve climate change and that's going to find the right solutions for climate change. It is something that does require an effort at all levels. Uh, as you said, Dan, you know, a lot of the the carbon is produced in cities. I mean, 75% of all of the greenhouse gas emissions are produced in cities. And that's a really startling, I think, statistic when you think about the challenge that then throws back onto local government. And we know that local government is often the least resourced part of government. And yet those challenges of actually making the change, shifting the changes, are really are huge. Um, and I think that there's another thing that we really need to think about in terms of local government, which is also that kind of convening role that local government can play when it works really well, which is actually trying to bring all of those different agents and actors in a community together. I mean, we talked a little bit about the, the climate partnership here, but you see a number of um, local authorities who are convening that for all of their planning as a, as a local authority. Carl cited Bristol, but there's also you know Rwanda, Kigali, where they're doing a lot around Green City Kigali to try and bring all of the actors that are involved in uh, climate change together. So I think that that convening power of local government is very strong. And I think, you know, we need to get away from the idea that local government has to deliver all of those solutions. What local government can do really well is enable those solutions and support those organisations that can then invest and, and make a change in terms of the amount of carbon that's being produced. Thanks, Lucy. Before I bring in the other rest of the panel, I, I want to open it up to the, to the floor, either for comments or questions or challenges to the panel. Um, so uh, I see some hands going up already. Yes, gentlemen at the front, please. Maybe just say who you are, if you don't mind. Hello. Um, <clears throat> my name is Chris Little. I'm a Canterbury resident. Um, I would like to suggest that Canterbury declares itself to aim to be the first fossil fuel free transport city in the UK and then it declares it's going to aim to do that by 2030, that's in eight and a bit years time. I think we need to be incredibly aggressive about treating this problem. The release of carbon dioxide in the world is still increasing. It's not fallen at all since COP1. We've been farting around for 25 years. Everyone's been wringing their hands and saying we must do something about it. And everybody has basically been nudging it into the future, into the future. Um, <clears throat> according to 
the IPCC, we need to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030. We have really got to get our fingers extracted and do something. So I suggest we declare Canterbury is going to be the first fossil fuel free city for transport in the UK. We will do that by banning um, uh, diesel and petrol cars from the inside the city factories. We will do that by bringing in loads and loads of um, <coughs> uh, chargers into all the car parks. It will be free to charge your car in the car park, but if you've got a fossil fuel burning car, it will cost twice as much to park in that car park, so you're paying for the, the free transport for other cars. And we should really need to be doing something which is really, really bold because we have to extract our digit. Okay. Thank you. So I'll bring the panel in a minute. I'll take one or two more contributions. But I think transport policy, um, going maybe for 2030 rather than 2045, um, that's something I'll bring back to the panel in a minute. And, and I was pleased, by the way, on, on that issue that um, outside Westgate Hall, there are now some charging points, which obviously plug mine my car in when I get a chance. Uh, lady behind her was next, and then the gentleman over there, please. Sorry, just making sure you can hear me. Um, I just wondered um, how council, local government in the future can force local builders, for example, to put in smart meters, solar panels, and other different forms of heating. I mean, know this part of Kent, as well, I'm sure most other parts of the country, are surrounded by building sites at the moment. Um, I actually live in Faversham. Um, the Duchy of Cornwall, for example, is building um, four and a half thousand new houses. Um, but what steps can we, you, take to ensure that as costs rise, these um, carbon neutral devices are not dropped off the building agenda? Very important point. In fact, uh, so I'll take one or two more points. Uh, possibly William might want to think about that one because we, within CCAP we have a special building group which is addressing exactly those sort of issues and the, the passive house concept and so on, uh, which is going to be such a key contribution towards um, uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, gentlemen up there, now bring in the one more and then the panel, please. Yeah, I, I live in North Canterbury and um, I just want to make three comments. Um, when I'm walking down Whitstable Road, I sometimes see the 20 mile an hour limit, and that's a very interesting limit. Uh, no one obeys it. I then get to the uh, level crossing, and there's a little sign, and if you're very good, and you can see with your eyesight, it says, every minute of idling will fill up 150 balloons. And you look at 10 cars, and nine are idling. So no one's doing anything there. And then a councillor recently wrote to me, as well as everyone else in Richmond Gardens and Hillside Avenue, saying, do you know that those beautiful fields, Duke's Meadow and Neil's Meadow, will have a lovely 750 car park and 14 to 17,000 homes? Now, being a mathematician, I can say 17,000 homes have got about 35,000 people, each one has a car. You've suddenly got 35,000 more cars. How is the council really looking at, say, climate <coughs> emergency, so thinking of building 35,000 cars, or sorry, 35,000 people with cars, and not, not looking at the 20 mile an hour speed limit, enforcing it, or enforcing anything, because I can come up with the uh, diktats, and if nobody actually obeys those diktats, it's meaningless, absolutely yeah. meaningless. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> right, um, Gentleman in, in the middle there, and then I think we'll bring the panel around, all around there. Uh, my, my name is Michael Leeming. I'm, I'm a little outside Canterbury, although I've lived in Canterbury for 34 years. Um, I'm interested in the comments that uh, Canterbury is going to be, has declared a climate emergency is going to be carbon neutral. I assume you're really talking about carbon neutrality in terms of the assets that you actually control. Because Canterbury will not be carbon neutral unless you can do something about 
the state of the housing, the insulation, the release of CO2 into the atmosphere from all of the housing in the city. Are you doing anything at all about that? And can you even afford to? Okay, actually, one more look at the chap at the back there, very last row, please, a little bit. Hat on, yep, and then we'll, we'll come back to the other, other, other audience later. Uh, the gentleman at the very back, sorry, sorry, the one with the hat on. At the, at the, at the end, we'll bring, you, we'll bring you in a minute, sir. All right. Hi there, it's Henry Stanton from Canterbury Green Party. Um, just wondering what the panel think uh, is the role of the local council in terms of mitigation of the effects of climate change? Because the reality is that some of the effects of climate change are already being felt in terms of flooding and um, extreme weather events. And uh, I think that there should be a response from the council, hopefully a plan, as to how they're going to deal with those effects. Right, let me give um, Dicky Dan a chance to take a breather because he's going to have to fight all those questions. But I hope William and Ella and Lucy can also come in on, on some experiences they have. Um, first, before I ask Dan to come in, um, just a little little information um, on transport. Um, tomorrow, I think late afternoon, there will be a special session at Catholic College addressing exactly those sort of issues you raised, sir. So do come along if you're free tomorrow. Uh, I think it's about five or something at Catholic College for the, the cast group. It's, it's, Transport, transport group is, is doing a session on that. Um, Dan, do you want to have a kick off to come through issues there, and then I'll bring in William and maybe others. <laughs> yeah, how have I got? Uh, I've got quick, brief, brief, brief. I've got, I've got, I've got five questions, so I'll, I'll have a go at uh, giving a, a little bit of time to each, but be, be brief. Um, yeah, to, to, to Chris at the front there, you know, trying to become a, a, a fossil fuel city for transport. Um, uh, absolutely, transport are about a quarter of the country's emissions, and it wouldn't be very different here in Canterbury. So we absolutely need to tackle that. And actually, whereas uh, nationally we've been doing very well in certain sectors, like power generation, in, in, in getting rid of coal, driving down emissions, we have not got very far with reducing transport emissions. So if we can achieve your goal, Chris, then we will have tackled a major uh, obstacle to achieving um, you know, carbon neutrality. A couple of, yeah, so we, we recognise the issue, a couple of things that we're doing to, to, to tackle that. Um, you know, we, we are putting in a lot of electric vehicle charging points. You know, that has to be a big strand of what we do. Um, people will, will continue to drive and therefore we have to make them drive cars which are fossil fuel free. Um, and uh, we're actually, doing well here in Canterbury, we'll have just under 100 uh, EV charging points um, off street, by which I mean, um, sorry, on street, by which I mean not on private driveways, so car park and, um, and, and public streets, uh, by February. So that will make us ahead of, that will be the leading local authority in the whole of the southeast of England, so yeah, that, that will be an achievement, and our, our plan is to have another 700 within five years, so very ambitious, uh, but we've made a good start, and that will really help. I think the other thing we really need to do is boost active travel, so that's walking and cycling, and public transport. Um, and, you know, I, yeah, there is money now, finally, there's money. First time, actually, in my lifetime, there's a, a national government pot of money which you can bid into, um, called the Active Travel Fund, to promote a cycling and walking schemes. And one of those is open for consultation at the moment, and I encourage you all to go onto the Kent County Council website and uh, have your say on it and hopefully support it uh, uh, around Burgate through to Longport and out towards Littlebourne, which will be a major uh, boost to people who want to cycle and walk into the city from that, that direction. I can't say more, I could speak for 20 minutes on this topic, but uh, I won't. On new buildings, um, actually, uh, that, that... Actually, let, let me pull you on to the new buildings, yeah, yeah. otherwise, otherwise um, give you a breather. William, do you want to come yeah. in on the new buildings, this year, and then I'll come back to Dan, maybe. Okay, okay. Um, it's... Um, I promised I'd be easy on Dan. Um, we had a little chat before um, because uh, I, I stand completely and utterly, totally at odds with Dan in relation to the local plan for the third option. Um, and it's interesting to hear you say, Dan, that there's money for active travel fund because at the moment the only rationale behind, there are two rationales behind the local plan, the housing bonanza, um, this extraordinary, exaggerated uh, number of 14 to 17,000 extra homes. The reason behind that is exclusively in order to free up funds, either Section 106, or depends on what the future of that particular scheme will be, bearing in mind planning nationally is going through all sorts of ups and downs at the moment, and it's hard to keep track. Um, but uh, the exclusive reason for the extra homes is in order to free up funds, 
in order to build new roads. Now, I'm sorry, but this is yesterday's uh, logic. In fact, not even yesterday, this is the logic of the 1970s. Um, it was already dated in the 1990s when, under John the Major's government, there was a massive um, uh, road building scheme across the country, and numerous pro uh, reports came out after that, especially the new bypass one, to demonstrate that building new roads encourages car uh, and encourages greater use of those roads and greater traffic. And in fact, in the case of the Newby Bypass and Twyford Down at Winchester, it didn't reduce the amount of traffic in the very places where there was hitherto uh, traffic. So therefore, we're in a situation whereby talking about active travel, talking about sustainable transport, talking about uh, plans for uh, decarbonisation of the traffic infrastructure, to build uh, 14 to 17,000 additional to the existing plans which are already in the pipeline, which amount to nearly 13,000, and although Mountfield Park is currently in uh, question, uh, no doubt the developers will come back and appeal, and no doubt they will get through, because it's prep generally happens, even though the judicial review, one would think, would be the buck stops there, but no. Um, so therefore, the staggering new number of builds will lead to a staggering new number of cars. And whether those cars are uh, driven, uh, whether they're, they're, they're fossil fuels or not, they're all fossil fuels. Let's just be realistic about this. And what we don't want to be doing is twofold. Uh, clearing away our, our, our front garden of rubbish and dumping it into our neighbour's uh, garden instead. We'd be doing that twofold. One would be by trying to improve the city centre, which I'm all for. The traffic in Canterbury is abysmal, it's diabolical, and it's, it's, it's horrendous. And I worry so much about the health of myself, and my children, and my friends, and the citizens and residents of Canterbury. I think the, the traffic in Canterbury is shameful. But the only way to deal with this by building new bypasses through the countryside is equally shameful, I'm afraid to say. Now, so, on the one hand, we can improve the city centre transport and traffic and have a lovely green economy uh, uh, in the city centre and have um, in the sustainable infrastructure transport and have walking, walking and cycling and all this as long as we dump all the traffic outside, in areas that are currently green, and they are green. One is farmland, woodland, uh, a river valley, um, uh, uh, hedgerows, um, and the other, as you may or may not know, the eastern bypass running from the A2 to the A28 in Sturry, A2 in Edbridge to the A28 in Sturry, will be going through a triple SI. This is just appalling, beyond every level of appallingness. Now, by Building those roads, we would be A, taking up an enormous carbon expenditure, a, a quite colossal carbon expenditure for the building of the roads, and there's no way we can get around that. You can't build okay. roads out of cardboard. Um, and secondly, we would then be offloading the problem. And secondly, we'd be offloading the problem, and I'm afraid to say, to reply to, to Chris here as well, we would be also offloading the problem in terms of a bid to continue with the existing level of transport, but having it all electric. All we're doing there is offloading the problem elsewhere in the world where the minerals are to mine for those. What we have to do is get people out of their cars. That is fundamental. In order to do that, as every study going back 30 years has shown, in order to get people out of their cars, you have to improve public transport. That's it. Is, is the answer, uh, one of the answers anyway. Um, Lucy, what, what's the sort of international experience of, of some of these issues that have been raised? Obviously, you know, those, those things aren't unique to Canterbury. No, it's interesting, and I, and I think, you know, obviously I don't know the Canterbury situation so well, but I, you can hear this, these kind of contentious issues globally. I mean, these are the challenge, this is the challenge we face. This is a very contested kind of political place. Everybody has a different view. And I think you know one of the key challenges that we face is how do we sort of really strengthen our local governments and, and, and other organisations to be able to have a sensible grown-up conversation about some of these issues. And I think one of the things that we've been trying to promote and I think has, has been really useful is, is trying to take a little bit of a step back and maybe realise that you know these things have happened in many other places many times before and we have a great opportunity because of the, the kind of the nature, I guess, of technology now and the contacts that we have to really try and learn from people who've maybe done some of these things before. Now, I'm not saying that there's an exact replica of some of the challenges that you face here, but, you know, lots of places are grappling with exactly this issue. Uh, you know, whether that's other 
cities and communities in Europe or even beyond. And I think, you know, in this country particularly, we maybe need to think and recognise that, you know, it's, it's, we can look outside our borders to actually learn how other people have dealt with some of these challenges. So I'm, I'm not going to get myself, Carl, into the kind of like the, the, the issues in Canterbury, but those issues replicate themselves, as we all know, across our own country and, and beyond these borders. And I think, you know, there's something that we can really offer, I think, in terms of, and COP is, you know, one of those opportunities to actually sort of think about how we can learn from some of those good solutions, because there are good solutions out there, and there are places that have made progress in this area, and we all know that it takes a lot of hard work, and it does really take people coming together and actually deciding what they really want to do, and, and that's a process. It's not something that's gonna happen overnight, it's not something that we can make happen tomorrow, but it is something that the kind of commitment that we have of you know, people coming together, wanting to talk about climate change and what that means for the community, the next step of that is actually, okay, so how do we actually have an adult conversation about what we really want to do as a town or as a city or as a community? Thanks, I'm gonna bring in Ella in a minute, and I'll give her views on some of these that's been raised, but, but it reminded me, Lucy, that um, <laughs> One or two years ago, interesting, you mentioned earlier Kigali in Rwanda, and I was very struck when I uh, arrived in, in Kigali to find that um, it was actually a, a car free Sunday. The entire city had banned cars on the Sunday. Uh, they banned plastic bags altogether, not just not just put 10p on them or whatever the local currency was, um, but you know, actually banned full stop. And you know, some countries abroad are, are going, even developing countries like Rwanda, are, are going much further than. than we are uh, currently in this country. But Ella, what, what's your perspective? I mean, there's lots of issues have been raised, you know, we're gonna try and address some of them as we go along. We haven't responded to everybody as yet. But what, what's your perspective on some of these that's been raised? Um, I, I mean, the Greta Thunberg famously said recently, there's too much blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's too much blah, blah, blah? Uh, oh, sorry, um, there really is. So the one thing that strikes out to me is public transport and how you say, to promote that more, but there is a very big lack of it. To me, going out to smaller areas, so I'm from Charlton, a car journey that would take me 15 minutes in the morning to get to school, takes me an hour because of the amount of traffic in Winchie, and that is purely because there are not enough buses to get the school children to school. So parents are resorting to driving children themselves. And from here, going to look at the building, so where I am, they're planning on building an estate of somewhat affordable housing in Cochrane Road. So that isn't even on the bus service, but that's probably what, 100, tra um, 100 homes on average, two children. That's getting two more children to school in an area that's already overpopulated. There's not enough public transport. So that's more cars on the road, which will then probably make my journey to school even longer. And the giving more public, so even that, so, if I go to school and I'm late, I'll get the 25. Half the time I'm one of two people on that bus, but that bus service runs every 10 minutes. The same as for London Road Estate and Spring Lane. So there are enough services there going out that way that are half full, running carbon emissions because they're not green buses either. So that's a really big issue considering I can I'm finish a lesson and I'm then stuck waiting for an hour, so I might as well walk home. Well, I couldn't agree more. I, I live in a uh, host little village you know, near, near Pern Bay, and I think there's, what is it, Adele, my wife here, um, what, three or four buses a day, if that, you know, so it's an issue. Um, but uh, Dan, I, I want to move on from local government and, and broaden some of the other issues, um, but I, I know quite a few other things have been raised. Do you want to just briefly touch on a few of the other things that have come up, uh, uh, just very briefly? Yeah. Maybe I'll try and whisper a bit. So I think the um, lady down there from, from Faversham was talking about what, what are we doing for new buildings to make sure that they're energy efficient? And um, this comes down to planning and, 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 and uh, energy efficiency standards in, in buildings. Um, here in Canterbury, we're currently going through our new local plan, which will set all of the planning rules for building new homes and indeed yes, for yes, um, uh, refurbishing existing homes. And I mean, the good news there is we are being very ambitious and maybe uniquely for a, for a rural constituency. Because remember, although we're called Canterbury City District, we're actually a huge area around, including uh, the, the area of outstanding natural beauty and our, and our, and our coastal communities as well. Um, and um, we will be, I think, the first rural community who uh, will have net zero enshrined in their local plan for building. So that means that uh, 
anything built in the future would be would be net zero. So you know, we've got a long way to go in terms of actually getting that signed off to the various authorities, but that's our ambition and, and it's got cross-party political support and I'm hopeful we will achieve that. Um, the gentleman over here talked about 20 mile per hour enforcement, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, a challenge across the district, including in the town I represent, Herne Bay. Um, I think uh, the, the, the preferred route to enforcing from the police, because it's the police who uh, enforce speed limits, is community speed watch, working with the police as a way that volunteers will go out with the police um, and basically speed gun uh, vehicles which are speeding and then they get ultimately a knock on the door from a friendly police officer to uh, remind them not to do that and ultimately speed traps if the, the problem uh, continues. So if anyone's got an issue with speeding their area, if get in touch with the community uh, speed watch, uh, you can Google that and find it online and that is a good solution for communities where they've got a few volunteers willing to tackle speeding and the police will step in um, uh, with you. And just maybe a final quick point, someone asked about, well, you know, the, the, the council has its target of 2030, what about everything else going on in our, in our district which commit, produces carbon pollution? Uh, well, that is, that is the, the target uh, which I referred to before, which was to reduce carbon uh, uh, dioxide to, to nothing by 2050. We're just in the process of bringing that target forward to 2045. So that's what we're saying. The council will get its house in order, if you like, by 2030, and then we will work with the community to make that everyone has um, reached net zero by 2045. So we've got all of those tough things to do, like private transport, private heating, uh, industry, business emissions. We've got all that to do on top of what the council is trying to do. But we have a target and, and we have a plan to achieve that. William, although I see you, you you're really so I've given Dan a hard time, no, so no, give another hard time. No, no in fact, <laughs> quite the opposite. And I, I, I actually like to apologise to Dan, because actually I've broken my own rule here in relation to the local plan, and that is I didn't address the many wonderful things in the local plan, and uh, Dan has been a contributing factor to that, as has Nicholas sitting down here. Um, there are some tremendously ambitious and very good parts of the local plan, especially in relation to, um, to decarbonisation, mm -hmm. even though we've got a double-edged sword there, but also in terms of the housing, and again, a double-edged sword in terms of quantity of housing, but there are some very, very good standards that are being introduced in relation to emissions and in relation to materials. So that, that's, that's to be really commended. It's, uh, there are some fantastic parts of this, especially in relation to, to, to build. And of course, what we want is that the joined up thinking across the board, so that it's not a bold and ambitious here, but retrograde here, but the, the, bold and, the boldness and the ambition is across the board, and that's obviously what the ongoing discussion, what was part of the public consultation, is now part of this ongoing discussion, such as today and in many other fora, um, is all part of this, 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 this overall consultation towards that joined up thinking across the board. Yeah. Okay, um, let's bring in a couple more comments from the audience, um, rather than have a sort of question and then move on to the next sort of area. Um, hey, down the bottom there, please, yes, um, second row. I was wondering um, whether the extra funding that comes from the, the extra houses that we're going to get, could that, instead of going towards bypasses and extra roads, go towards improving public transport? Are there, are there restrictions on what you can use that money for, please? Or? The simple answer is yes, it will be used for sustainable development uh, as well as uh, link roads or bypasses to take traffic off the A28, which is the inner ring road. That is, that is the... A public uh, transport specifically? Yeah, absolutely, no, absolutely, yeah. because the inner ring road in our radical plan, and I don't know, it's, I know it's controversial because it's radical, uh, and you know, I feel it as much as any of the councillors, um, and at this stage it's only an option, I might add. At this stage we don't know where those extra roads are going to also, they won't necessarily go through um, the SSSI. They, they, you know, I'm not saying, I can put the route down for sure now, we can't, but um, it will include making that inner ring road uh, free of basically private car traffic, which means the buses which get stuck on that road and mean that people like Ella cannot get into Canterbury City Centre without very long journeys, will have priority lanes whizzing through uh, and that will be you know, transformational, so there'll be a lot of money spent as well on sustainable, develop, uh, sustainable transport and active transport. And I hope that that'll apply to um, villages like Hoth as well. <laughs> right. you, you can have your own car park. 
I'm not sure. I don't want to dice my bus service. Okay, um, let me move on to another area. We'll have a chance to come back to some of these, these issues. Um, yesterday, some of you and my friends from Hoathbridge and others uh, were there at the cathedral, and we're very privileged to have one of our, our patrons, who is the um, uh, Reverend Bishop Rose Hudson Wilkin, Bishop of Dover. And she, those of you who heard her give a very dynamic uh, address sermon about the importance of addressing climate change. However, she did say one thing which perhaps I may be wrong, not everybody would agree with, which is that um, uh, she said there are better ways of taking climate action than gluing yourselves to motorways. Uh, and I know that Extinction Rebellion, I believe, is also taking that same view. Um, but what does the panel think? What does the audience think? What, is that a legitimate action? Is that something we should do? Or are there better ways of raising the climate profile? Ella, what about you? Um, so personally, I haven't ever taken part in any form of protest. Just for the forms that have been going on, I live with my grandparents who haven't wanted to bring anything home with the current climate. But I do feel like gluing yourself to a road or to a train, as they were doing a few years ago in London, is a bit extreme and public transport also they're using public transport so they're not using cars so i didn't really understand that one but i i do think it's it's giving more bad press than good press and i feel like youth this is something that we're all passionate about as seen by it being voted on on not only the kent youth county council but also the make your mark ballots being one of uk youth parliament's Parliament's main priorities is any press is good press. So the bad press is raising the awareness to it. So while it isn't a legitimate form of what we want to do, it's getting the word out there because people aren't listening to us. Okay, what does the audience think? Are uh, any, any views on this? I mean, is it a legitimate tactic or uh, are there better ways of doing things? Are there different ways of doing things? Um, okay, gentlemen uh, from the Green Party again, yeah, please. Thank you. Um, I think uh, the important thing to note is that this is a climate emergency and uh, it's the emergency bit we should be focusing on. I'm not sure this forum should even really be discussing the particular tactics of one particular group. I think the thing that we're here for is how we can move forward. It's not about the specific tactics of a particular protest group. Um, the other point is that we haven't really talked enough about insulation and I think the Insulate Britain people have at least raised that idea up the agenda. People are now talking about the previously quite boring subject of insulation. Any other views on this? Okay, I know insulation was raised, we didn't really respond very much on it from the panel, so I'm going to come back to that. Um, okay, if nobody wants to come on this specific, can I, mean, can I ask one more question? Okay, we need to get some other members of the audience, but go ahead please, yeah. The government had um, a sort of a green uh, idea in which uh, you could actually do some insulation of your home. It only lasted a few months. And uh, it took me about 20, 25 emails and four or five phone calls. Eventually, somebody from Sittingbourne put some loft insulation. It was about 500 quid. I had to pay 30%, which is 100. And it's now stopped. So those people that are gluing themselves to cars or whatever have got a very big point because as a physicist, if you've got all this energy going in, say 14,000 kilowatt hours, and 20, 30, 40% just going up the roof, if you could actually insulate 20 million homes, one, you're providing a lot of work for high paid engineers, and two, you're saving an awful lot of gigatons. And unfortunately, people like Boris Johnson and other people who are all artists, I haven't got much idea about science, and they have no leadership skills. So I'd rather back a few people s s gluing themselves to a few cars and causing a bit of inconvenience, really. I mean, the pandemic will kill, what, 150,000 in this country, 7 million. What do you think global warming is going to do by the end of this century if it's 2.8 degrees Celsius? A lot more! So let's get real. I went onto a website and I'm doing 12 tonnes of CO2 a year. Now tell me how to do it. Eat vegetarian things, okay, I've not got 0.3 tons here. Get rid of that diesel car, I'll do more cycling, yeah. 
five towns here. Don't go to New York, two and a half. I can do it, but I would like to see some leadership. I want to see people getting leaflets through the door, telling them what to do to go from 12 tons to five to four to three. Let's focus on the buildings rather than on the action. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. uh, it's a back to what we see here. Yeah. Oh, okay, yes, right, okay, okay please. I, I, would, I would really like to follow up on that last, that last point. I had ex almost exactly the same experience with this appalling green scheme. Yeah. I spent hours and hours and hours discussing with the a totally, totally idiotic administrators. I, I, I give them a title of administrators. They couldn't organise the, the classical business in a brewery. They were terrible. They couldn't identify me. They, they, they had that, my data upside down in their computers and couldn't turn it round. I never come across such a poor administration. And, and ultimately, my application, I had to withdraw the application because my builder eventually said, look, I'm not quite uh, qualified to do this. I'm, I'm going to try and join, I'm going to try and do it. And he found he's going to cost him a huge amount of money to just join, get the right qualification, which he had anyway. He was a bloody skilled builder. The government, okay. the government was, it was run by idiots. And I suspect it might have been, I'm being very devious here, or someone was being devious, I suspect the scheme was being run so badly to run, slow it all down and give the government an excuse to close it down. Okay, okay, let's, let's go out and get some views from the panel about specifically building, because I, I know that's a huge domestic building, and an office building for that matter, is a huge area of, of potential carbon emission savings. And um, William, can you talk a little bit about the, um, I know you talk about the, the, the wider issues, but can you talk a bit about what the CCAP building work uh, group is doing on, on things like the passive house and some of those standards which we're trying to encourage? And then I'll bring in Dan and Lucy. I can briefly, I'm not an expert on the, uh, on the building, and I'm, I'm actually not in the subgroup of the, uh, of the Canterbury Alliance for Sustainable, sorry, of the building subgroup, sorry. Um, but what the, 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 the passive house, that I'm sure most people are familiar with, the passive house standard has everything within the, uh, the, the, the question of materials, the question of, uh, of, um, of insulation, the question of uh, input, throughput, and output. Um, of the energy flows and the water. And it is a standard that really should be wheeled out as a baseline. Um, and now, of course, the, there are many arguments against it in terms of, as always, cost. But then when we scrutinize the entire housing bonanza um, of the last 10 to 15 years, we realize how costs have been siphoned off um, through uh, extortionate land prices and then through the developers. Um, and we know this for those of you who, who are familiar with the question of affordable housing. Um, it's rarely affordable and it's rarely the amount that was promised. So therefore, when the, um, when the appeals are made against the, the cost of passive house, that has to be set against all the other costs which are uh, being introduced through other ways, which is the monies that are flowing around, there is ample money for that. It's just about the choices that are being made. I wanted to make one small point, though. Sorry, on, on this, on, on building? That is building, yeah, right, on yeah, the yeah, passive yeah, house. Yeah. And on building, just one thing about, about solar, and I think this is very important, because I, I'd just like to make this, this is slightly tangential, I appreciate that. But that is, I'm very concerned, again, it's, it's talking about joined up thinking. At the moment, as you probably know, there are plans to build on Gravely Marshes an enormous solar farm. Now, this is obviously part of our bid towards net zero, and it's great decarbonisation, but the loss of the wetland is catastrophic and despite the promises of the um, of the build for biodiversity net gain and that rings alarm bells when you see that expression whilst at the same time all over the city the wind chief industrial estate for example and elsewhere there are flat roofs with no solar panels we could we could have exactly the same amount of solar panels on all the new builds we could have the roofs completely covered in the, this was one of the major things of the building subgroup of, of ccap is looking at orientation of houses in order to maximise the solar return. And therefore, instead, what we're having is the trashing of a wetland, which is very important for migratory species, very, very important wetland, and the natural carbon sink. And yet we're losing that in order to have the very thing that is supposed to be protect, that helping our way forward. It's that lack of joined up thinking, and this is part of the, of the building, 
if we need, we really do need to address exactly what are the standards, what are the baseline standards, and whether we can raise that. on uh, maybe not so much the technicalities but the sort of wider experience on, on insulation on buildings is this sort of thing that's being looked at in other countries and other cities across the world it is definitely being looked at in other cities across the world and i think what it really really highlights and a bit picking up on what you were saying just a second ago in terms of the joined up thinking and i think it really highlights how you know you really need local government and central government to at least be in conversation with each other and i think you know there's a real challenge there and i think you know, there's a, a huge role for local government associations, which are the kind of organisations that bring different local governments together on a, a sort of non-partisan basis to look at some of these really challenging questions. So certainly the LGA has been supporting a lot of councils around, um, in this country, around the, the climate emergency. And I think, you know, you really... You, you really can't, it's, it's a classic example of where, you know, government makes a policy and says we're going to put insulation into everybody's home. The government can't actually do that. Government needs local government, it needs the private sector, but it actually needs to knit those things together. And first and foremost, it needs to do what all of those protesters are saying, which is actually, you have to listen to us, this is what we want. So I think everybody has a role to play in this. I don't think we can denigrate anybody's role in that. Even, you know, protesters are doing exactly what they should be doing. They're putting these issues onto the public agenda and they're getting people interested in how things work in local politics or central politics, how they make change. And I think that's really important because actually lots of particularly young people, but not exclusively young people, are not interested in the formalities of politics. In fact, they find it quite off-putting. And I think one of the challenges that we have as a local government sector is actually how do we get young people to see that there are ways of making change and local government is one route through which you can make that change. So I think, you know, actually there's a, there's a lot of issues there around that whole issue of joined up government and, and, and I think that's a particular issue that we face and a real challenge in terms of younger people coming through. And if you think about it, I mean, I work in the Commonwealth, so countries across Africa, Asia, Caribbean, Pacific, 60% of the Commonwealth citizens are under 30. So you've got this huge cohort of young people coming through who are not really particularly engaged with what you would call, we would call, kind of mainstream politics. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a lot that we need to do there in terms of bringing people in and showing that the decisions that we're making as local leaders are inclusive. And they are listening to young people, old people, ratepayers, and obviously in many of the countries of the world that I'm dealing with, also all of those people living in informality that don't really have a particular kind of um, purchase in, in the communities in which they live. Ella, did you want to comment? Yeah, so you mentioned young people here not really being educated on like local politics to a scale, and in all honesty we aren't, but so we're not engaged with it because we're not being educated, we're not being told about it, and it's not being publicised. And when it comes to us raising our opinions, we were often told, we were often shut down and called ridiculous and we're not listened to. So we're not really as engaged, which is why we're turning to forms of protest, because that's how we're getting attention. Because to many polit politicians, we're not of voting age, so our opinion isn't as important to them. So even though we're raising the issues that need to be raised, they're not being taken seriously because we're not voting. Let, let's move on to sort of um, another aspect of what I think has been touched on already, which is the uh, the idea of different stakeholders. You know, we've got the community groups, we've got the activists, we've got the local government, um, and then one group that hasn't been mentioned yet is, is the business sector. And uh, you know, Canterbury um, bid is 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 was here, and uh, it's been very supportive of some of this work. Uh, clearly, green businesses have a lot of role to play. Um, they're also big polluters, uh, of business. maybe not so much the retail, but certainly uh, the supply chains, there's other areas. And I'm just wondering if there's any views about what our business community, whether in Canterbury or more broadly, can do to address zero carbon and, and do things. Uh, I mean, there will be a, a dedicated business day, which uh, is organized on Wednesday with all the local business, and we, we hope to get some very good ideas from that, which will be fed back into what's coming together on Friday at our rally, but any, any views on the role of businesses at this stage? Any, any 
Can you take it? Yes, gentlemen here, please. Uh, Gary Bradbury, village resident. I could just mention the role of agriculture in uh, reducing carbon emissions, and uh, it's not widely known, but uh, certainly the arable farming sector has greatly reduced its carbon emissions in the last 10 years, and particularly in the last five years even. And this is mainly done by reduction in consumption of diesel fuel, by uh, reducing uh, particularly cultivations. Um, and uh, not only that, at the same time, it's improving soil, soil health um, by uh, having less disturbance of the soil and then increasing the uh, population of earthworms. So please bear in mind, although agriculture does reduce emissions, there are some parts of agriculture that are doing very well on their carbon reduction. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, farms and businesses, you know, it's, it's an important sector. Um, any more views or any representatives from Lisa, anybody know? Lisa, Lisa Carlson from BAD. Uh, hi, so I'm, I'm Lisa Carlson, heading up the Business Improvement District in Canterbury. I think my phone is buzzing. Mike? Um, it, one of the things we're working on at the moment is to help reduce um, the amount of large vehicles that come in and out of the city through train waste, because that's something that is in our hands. Uh, we we can procure perhaps a, a, a better service which could save businesses money and our hope is that that will reduce emissions. I think one of the things, we're talking a lot about transport, we're talking a lot about building, uh, we're talking about solar, uh, we haven't talked about wind yet but that's really important as well. These are the things that are going to make big, huge impacts across our district and across the county but we have to do everything. And I think one of the most important things we need to do is to help businesses find out how to progress along this journey. And the best way we can do that, and in, in our experience, is to share the stories. Uh, because it's human nature, isn't it, that we're going to do something and take action because we heard from our neighbour that something worked really well. And those are the kinds of stories and forms of engagement that we're going we're gonna to focus on. But, um, you know, really interested to hear everyone's views about what they experience in the city and what you'd like to see going forward. Anybody else in response to? Yes, please, Fred. Yeah, hi, Fred McCormack. Uh, Lisa, I know you're meeting all the businesses on, on Wednesday, but uh, I'm someone who, who has a plant-based diet, uh, and I don't know how many uh, restaurants and eateries there are in Canterbury, uh, but my experience of uh, what they offer for someone who, who, who is, um, doesn't eat meat is really poor. Uh, I went to Brighton recently, and the quality of their, their, their menus was, was, was fantastic. I always feel that when I go to a restaurant in Canterbury, I'm the afterthought, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the ping going on in the background because I've asked for the vegetarian option. So, uh, you know, uh, plant-based food is amazing, uh, and I would really love to see Canterbury sort of uh, look at what places like Brighton are doing and make it something you know, that is, uh, you know, the star of the menu as opposed to the, you know, the poor relation. So if you're having any conversations on Wednesday, you know, I'd love to go out and eat more, but at the moment, it really is much out there that tempts me. Okay, good point. So something for Lisa to take back. Uh, okay, let's, let's just sort of touch on one issue, which I, I, I kind of left it, and I think it's important, but it was touched on, I think, by the panel. When we're talking about heat pumps, when we're talking about electric cars and... Um, I, I, there's a cost factor, um, and you know, obviously all of those of us who are very committed to climate say this has to be overcome, of course it has to be overcome. But if you're on a low income, if you're um, not earning much money, uh, I think that's the kind of audience we need to convince and to engage. And of course that comes back to the things which colleagues from audience were saying about the difficult accessing government grants, which are supposed to help with those, those kind of things. And you know, obviously that is an issue which has to be seriously addressed uh, people with, you know, couldn't afford a, a heat pump unless there's a massive government subsidy, couldn't afford an electric car, although I, I've just bought a, a very sort of old second-hand one, <laughs> um, which is an option rather than buying new. But, but Dan, what's, what's your answer to that? Um, how, how can we help the people who've got less money who say to us, oh, I can't afford this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a million dollar question in a way, isn't it? Because we need, we need uh, all households to decarbonise, and um, how do those who are on lower incomes afford that. If they can't afford it, it, it won't happen um, because you can't magic up money for those, for those households. 
I was pleased to see in the government's net, stra net zero strategy last week um, that most of the new money announced is going towards um, social housing, basically lower income uh, households to get access through often their council to more insulation uh, and other uh, retrofit solutions which would include heat pumps. Uh, because I think in that part of the market, it, it, it's going to have to be some pretty significant government intervention in order for us to achieve these, you know, these crucial targets on, on climate change. Um, I think for the rest of the, the rest of the, of the of the households, and we were talking about business a few moments ago. I think actually the prime minister got it right last week when he convened that global investment sum, summit for environmental uh, funding, essentially, and he said to Bill Gates. If all the governments in the world get together, we might be able to muster you know, several hundred billion pounds of money to tackle climate change. But if we focus on helping business invest in, in climate change solutions, you can bring in trillions and trillions of pounds of money. And that has to be part of the solution as well, because there just isn't enough money to go around for the government to do it all. So I think the government is right through some of its recent initiatives to help lower income households, but for the rest of society, which is the majority of society, I think we do need business to really step up. So at the micro level, what Lisa and Canterbury Bid is doing is, is, is crucial, making those changes in local businesses. Um, at Kent County Council level, we have the low case scheme. And if you know any businesses, I hope you're all sort of evangelists for the uh, climate change cause. And, and as you speak to your friends and contacts in the months and, weeks and years ahead, you, you, you tell people you know business owners, look at low case and Kent County Council website because there are grants and action uh, plans for businesses to sign up to, to decarbonise their businesses. Um, and then, yes, clearly the government just has to produce a good environment for investment so that you know, these big businesses, which are multinationals, you know, they'll be helping many of your members around the world, not just here in Britain, that they, they put that money in. Because actually, that is where the smart money is going to now. From the global financial centres, it wants to invest in... Um, nature-based solutions, energy efficient solutions, electric this, electric that, but the government does have to work hard to produce a kind of framework whereby they feel I'm going to get some sort of return if I do that. Lucy, you want to comment on that? Well, I, world, I'm I'm certainly, you know, I certainly agree with a lot, of, um, a lot of what you said and you talked a little bit about our members and I think the issue of um, getting private sector funding in to support some of our, our members is, is really crucial because you know the, the the resources just aren't there in the public sector, even less so if you're in many of the, the countries um, where we work. I think one of the bigger challenges though is you know we hear a lot about kind of global commitment to funding. You know, at the last COP there was a commitment of hundred billion dollars to go to poorer countries and, and that hasn't happened. So that will be another call at, at COP this time, but I think the, one of the challenges of that is also getting that money to where it needs to be. So, you know, we hear these big numbers bandied about, but what we've got to try to do is get the, the, that money to good projects on the ground, whether that's, run, whether that's local government projects or that's consortia of groups of um, organisations in one particular city or groups of cities. We've got to actually try to change a bit the kind of way in which governments allow cities maybe to borrow or access funds and these big funds which are designed really to sort of give big parcels of money to central governments are unpacked so that we can really get those funds down to the level at which we can see that change on the ground. I think that's a, a really a really big challenge and, and you know I totally agree with what you were saying as well in terms of the role of the private sector. I mean you know we do know that the money is there and you know there's a often people say the money's there but we can't find the good projects but what we need to do is we need to link up forward thinking local governments thinking about what they want to do to attract resources into their community working with their business partners working with the local community and other activist groups to say this is what we want and then I think we need to look at how we unlock those funds. Well one thing I do like about um, Canterbury City Council is that there has been a bit of a move very recently, I think Dan's been a champion of this towards a multi stakeholder approach, to use the jargon, which means really not just the, the council, but engaging with business, engaging with groups like CCAF, engaging with universities, the health, the health trust, NHS trust, and having a partnership approach. And we just had a meeting this afternoon with the chief executive 
um, on, on the leveling up front applications that the country is doing, and I think bringing that broader based approach uh, and, and some of the critical voices as well, I hope, uh, is going to be important. But, but William and, and Ella, any thoughts on, on this approach? Yeah. Uh, and then we'll move on to another area. Thanks. I'd like to I'd like to go back a little bit to address this um, to what Ella was saying about youth because I find that very I found that very wonderful your response there. Um, I've been uh, I'm a member of the SDG forum. I'm a member of the Sustainable Development Sustainable Development Goals Forum. I'm a member of the um, uh, uh, you know, CCAP. Obviously, I'm a member of um, the Biodiversity Network. I'm a member of a number of different networks, and we are generally, especially the men amongst us. Uh, all grey beards. Um, there are not very many people under the age of about 30, I'd say. Now, why well, is it thinning hair? And thinning hair, yes, etc., etc. But what, at the same time, I've been in Canterbury City Centre for pretty much every single one of the, um, the youth strikes for climate, and I find it incredibly moving. I find it beautiful because people are committed and they are motivated and they are energised and they are very much engaged in these questions. And there are a great number of people, and they do understand these issues, of course they do. And where this most came home to me, and I'm, I'm no doubt a number of you were there the other day, when little Amal came to visit Canterbury, what was so, it, was, it made me well up, I found it so wonderful, was how the young people knew all the story about little Amal. They knew exactly where she came from, where she'd been, the, the suffering she, she'd been subjected to in various places on her journey here, what she stood for, what she represented. And it's, it makes me think so often, the fact that we have a, t a, a more aging population in these different groups has a lot to do with the fact that it's people who've retired and therefore have a little bit more time on their hands, which is fair enough, and a little bit more disposable income. It's just a sort of standard, you know, it's, it's a clear reason for that. But it's, it, it does enthrall me to see that there's a lot of things happening, and it's perhaps I'm not invited to them all, but I don't see that what's happening. But I do know that a lot of things are happening. And therefore it comes to the next thing, which is about the, in terms of local businesses, obviously in terms of schools and universities and colleges. Now, again, one of the difficulties there is, as anyone who's studied sustainability will know, one tends to measure sustainability, such as you can measure it, but one tends to sort of assess sustainability through these three domains, and that's the economic, the social, and the, and the, um, and the environmental. But as we're seeing in every instance, across the board, in whichever organisation we're talking about, the economic sustainability is the only one that really matters, because clearly the environmental and social um, sustainability are meaningless if the economic viability of the institution is threatened, and if it collapses, then it doesn't matter what your lofty ambitions are for, for biodiversity. So financial sustainability is the only one that really matters. Now that is an unfortunate situation of this gradual rise of marketization of every single aspect of our lives, which means that everything is financialized and everything is down to this economic baseline. Now, that is what is motivating this lack of movement, because we need to get the economic return, always. So, yes, we'll be happy to do that, but where's the economic return? Because the other aspects of sustainability are only addressed in relation to the economic, uh, the economic return. That's an ideology. It's an ideology that's taken root over many decades. And it's an ideology that will somehow shift. And it probably will shift, and this will be my final point, so I'm droning on a little bit. But the ideology will shift because of crisis. Crisis will break that ideology. When we are all in a much more threatened position, that ideology of give me the economic return on that particular venture will no longer be seen as viable. And that's where the economic and the social will come to the fore. Do you think William? Do you think, do you think William, that the, the COVID crisis and the kind of emphasis placed on people like key workers has begun to change that mindset, and also you know the fact of lockdown and people not rushing out to the shops consuming is that, is that beginning to change that sort of attitude? With respect, I'd rather not talk about COVID. Okay, okay, okay. I mean, okay, it's 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 really the, the issue of you know. Have we, over the last 18 months, undergone some change in attitudes? Lady at the front, please. Um, um, Extinction and Rebellion is a big demand at COP is for citizen assemblies um, because lobbyists sort of interfere with what the potential is. Take the mic, yeah. Take the mic, very well. Thank you. <laughs> so I was just 
uh, wondering what your thoughts were about citizens' assemblies and if Canterbury, I, I guess, Cap are filling that role, but yeah. Okay, well, maybe that's a direct question to Dan on the hot seat yet again. Go on, Dan. Uh, I wish I was important enough to have ever been lobbied for anything, but um, <laughs> it probably goes on at a higher level of politician, I would, I would guess. Uh, but certainly, I, 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 don't, I don't think that local government, I would, I would see that as a, as a challenge. And of course, actually, citizens' assemblies, by and large, are being proposed at the, the local level. The, the government did have a huge citizens' assembly. I think it was, I think it, I think it was meeting in, in Birmingham, if I might remember correctly, um, about a year, two years ago, ran over a period of time. And, and that, was, that was very successful as a national conversation, but all of the rest of them are, are proposed locally. Um, I, I don't think if, if, if communities have them, they need to be done for fear of lobbying. I, I just don't, don't think that's, that's the challenge. Um, I think there are many different ways to, to engage. To realise the economic focus, the focus on the, on the financial, on the income, on the profit rather than the people. Yes, yeah, no, I, I, I take I take point, but I, I don't think um, I don't think we have some assembly will get us away from the fact that we have challenges of budget within within the council. Um, I think in many of the you know you talk about the, the economic uh, challenge that, that William eloquently described. In many ways, seeking a return is, is not a is not a problem. That's what everyone does, either through wanting a wage or if they're self-employed through just wanting an income. That is a, a profit. In the sense that's the money that comes into your household and you live from. The problem has been that pollution is not properly taxed and um, yeah. measures of reducing pollution are not properly subsidised in this, in this country. Now, the government's trying to make changes there and previous governments have also made changes. And you are right that when we try and do things like reduce the tax of fossil fuel, as an example, or increase the subsidy for, say, hydrogen. And by the way, if you're talking about local business action, you know, we're, we're fantastically proud that we will be having a green hydrogen plant built on council land up, up near um, Bay next year. Um, so we are doing you know, some project going the right direction. But if you take those, those subsidies, if you like, that the, 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 the fossil fuel industry sometimes gets, that they are lobbied against at the very highest level. But actually, I'm not sure that the, the citizens' assemblies would, would solve that because they're more for micro kind of consultation. But I, I do take the point, and it's you know important for all governments to not roll over because Exxon Mobil or whoever it might be um, is saying, well look, I need I need I need this income stream from fossil fuels for the next 50 years, because we haven't got 50 years, we've got we haven't got half of 50 years, you know, we have to start taking action now, don't we? Yep. As uh, Tomika says, action, not blah, blah. Uh, which actually brings us, I think we've got about 15 or so minutes left, oh, 10 minutes. Um, so somebody's going to come in on a minute, but uh, I, I do want to spend a bit of time talking about COP because that's going to be the, the big thing in the next few weeks. And getting a feel also from you, the audience, you know, what you think is, is, is going to be the value. We've already heard the suggestion about pushing for citizens' assemblies. Um, we're going to have a team, as I mentioned, at COP. It'll be Dan and myself. Lisa, Fred, you've heard, and y Yvonne, who's here somewhere as well, isn't it? Um, uh, Yvonne Freeman, where's Yvonne? Uh, yeah, she should be part of the CCAP team at COP. Uh, we're covering the, the two weeks, um, paying mostly for ourselves, by the way, because we have no money, <laughs> um, but, um, and, and going up, obviously, by, by train. Uh, but um, what I'd like to hear, really, is, is what are your expectations, if any, uh, about COP? Um, do, you, do you think that, you know, having thousands of people travelling to Glasgow is actually a good thing. How, how does that help climate change? Um, well, any views Any views on that? I'd like to bring some members of the audience who haven't spoken. Pascal, come on. Uh, Tell us about so that. I'm really excited that there are so many people um, who are willing to talk about the environment and uh, COP26 is a big example of that. What I want to know <coughs> is over the next year, what fraction of our uh, district's emissions are going to be reduced from conversations like this? Very good question. Uh, again, I think we're going to have to um, bring particularly Dan and William and on it, but also Hello. It's good to have another voice of youth. And I remember Pascal made a very eloquent presentation at the cathedral two years ago, didn't you? When we already addressed climate change and have we really progressed since two years? I don't know. Maybe we haven't. Maybe we have. Um, any, any other views? Yes, gentlemen there. A lot of the sad realities of the discussions at COP 
is that uh, whatever the government in Britain does and whatever the good public of Britain do, uh, our activities are as nothing compared with the uh, major carbon polluters in the world, particularly China and India, with lots of coal-fired power stations. So the question is, what can we do to influence what the major generations of carbon polluters do? Is that by perhaps a boycott of, of uh, trading with these countries or buying so many goods from them? What do you think? I'll, I'll just bring, I'll come back to Pascal's point, um, but I'll just bring Lucy in on that. Um, are we, um, should we not bother about COP? I mean, big emitters are, are China, India, Australia, um, Brazil's cutting down most of its Amazon forest. Um, well, what's your view on that, Lucy? What, what can the UK do? What, what, what is the point when, when, how can we influence the other countries? I kind of think, in a way, the point is the fact that COP does bring so many governments together that that does give us much more weight. I think, yes, as a UK, of course, there's no way we can sort of change the behaviour of, of other countries. I think that the importance of COP and the importance of having a moment like this when we bring not just governments together, but when there's going to be a huge kind of city um, engagement, a lot of civil society organisations, many activist groups will be there. I think what we're saying is globally we want to do something about it. And I think what we can do is obviously we can put in place targets that we can deliver on and we want to do our piece to, to do that. We can certainly support other countries, you know, whether they're sort of former colonies or whether they're developing countries, we can actually sort of support them to kind of leapfrog a little bit some of the technologies. I think there's real scope for us to, to, um, to do that. Um, we can put moral pressure on, on other countries, but I, do, I think it's, a, I think we're, not, we're, we're certainly going to not address climate change if we don't take this opportunity to come together. It may not be that everybody is there, it may not be that we can achieve the absolute perfect, but if we don't try it, if we don't keep moving forward, if we don't keep driving this agenda, then we know that we're lost. We know already greenhouse gas emissions are the highest that they've ever been. Um, and as someone said, you know, we've had all of these cops and we haven't brought the, the rates down. We know that this is a moment when we have to make change. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity and I think it's a levelling opportunity as well because it's something where we all globally have a stake. Um, you know, we know many of the small island states in the Commonwealth, you know, 1.5 degrees warming is too much. Mm -hmm. Countries that are already looking at where they can identify land in order to relocate their citizens when the sea levels rise, that's a real thing. That's happening right now to communities and countries. So I think it is an incredibly important moment. And I know that there'll be lots of people who'll say, oh, you know, lots of people taking aeroplanes, you know, climate, that's going to just cause more carbon. But I think that misses the point of the importance and the significance of it as an event. Well, just, just by way of example, I remember being at the um, Commonwealth Leaders Summit in, in Malta in 2015, which was just before the, the big Paris Climate Conference. Now, they went on to Paris and took part there. And uh, what was interesting was the connection um, between the two events, because prior to the Commonwealth Leaders Meeting, which was you know, Prime Ministers of UK, India, Canada, South Africa, you name it, uh, Presidents, um, India was the big polluter in the Commonwealth, is a big polluter, and they were strongly resisting the 1.5 target, even resisting the 2 degree target. And because of the pressure of all the other countries, including many small states of the Commonwealth, at that Malta meeting, which was just two weeks before the Paris meeting, the Indian government did shift its position. Now, you can still argue you know, how much they really done and they're still doing lots of coal things, but there was a real pressure which forced India to go along with the climate <coughs> agreement in Paris, which previously they weren't going to sign up to. So I think you can push countries through peer pressure uh, at these kind of events, and, and they are important in shifting forward and agreeing on the national uh, contributions, the carbon emission contributions. So I think it is really an important event uh, where things must be must be achieved and it's, it's going to be absolutely critical um, at all sorts of levels. Um, okay, um, any more points from the audience? Yes, lady at the back, please. Thank you. I'm really hoping that COP26 is going to embarrass the hell out of a lot of governments around the world. 
um, including Britain, I'm afraid, um, and also that people's voices will finally be heard. Um, and I hope the media is actually honest in what it says and we're all honest about what the real problems are. Um, I don't want it to be a whitewash. Um, and I hope my Australia, I'm Australian, sorry, I'm embarrassed. Um, I hope Australia gets a bit of a kicking actually because it's time that we stopped pretending um, that country, that, that the Western countries are good and the others are bad. So I really hope, I hope it's positive and I hope everyone stands up and we've got a real chance of making something happen. Hi, I'm Juliet and I live in Tavisham. Um, the Australia got me going because I'm a dual citizen and I spent 41 years in Australia and I'm retired back here. And when you said Australia is one of the worst polluters, that rang a bell, you know, because, and, and this also brings in India and China and, and so on. Australians don't believe that any reductions are going to make much difference because we've been told that, uh, and I say we because I'm we with both countries, <laughs> um, we believe, they believe, that it's only 2% of the world polluters and what's, and literally I've heard that people say this, what's the point of me bothering to sort my rubbish and, you know, go to electric cars and make any effort at all when China's doing this and India's doing that. So that's point one. So, Mindset. So on the same token of mindset, India, China, all these smaller countries, they're saying, well, we the West, we've creamed off the best. You know, we've, we've had it good for, them for years, imperialism and all of that sort of thing. Maybe we should be helping them rather than pointing the finger. But particularly India, I mean, sorry, this, yeah, particularly India, rather than doing sanctions and, and making it harder for them, they're just going to dig their heels in. I, I don't, I don't know what the actual statistics were for Australia, but I'm thinking, particularly the poorer countries, that maybe they need more help rather than sanctions to make it worse for them, because they're going to resort to the cheapest form, which is gold. I, I don't know. It's just a no. I, and I think, as, as Lucy said earlier, you know, the, the commitment, the commitment that was made uh, previously for the hundred billion um, hasn't been met. You know, which was a previous promise. So they're saying we can't meet previous commitments you, the Western rich countries, you know, or why should we bother sort of thing? Um, okay, um, I'm going to, I think, bring it almost to a close, but I haven't gone past that. Um, so, gentlemen there, please, into the blue jumper, and one more over there, and I think we'll probably have to move to a close. Thank you. Yvonne, I think it was. Back. Back in 2006, Nicholas Stern wrote the uh, really seminal report uh, about climate change at a time when really it wasn't being discussed very much. And his main thrust was, if you, don't, if you don't act soon, it's going to cost you an awful lot more. Um, and he, he, he gave figures to that. And I think, building on what William said, there's a real chance to bring the environmental issues into the economic discussion. Right. So I think if COP hammers home the point Delay will cost you money, China. Delay will cost you money, India. Uh, but at the same time, give support uh, to help them see what they can do. Maybe a, a carbon capture and storage is one way forward. It's very costly at the moment, but maybe there's possibilities there. Maybe there's other possibilities. But don't delay, or uh, delay as little as you possibly okay. can, because it will cost you an awful lot more money. Exactly. The message tonight has to be, you know, we move forward now, we don't delay. Y Yvonne, Yvonne Fleming. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm proud to be one of the, part of the delegation going to COP26. I also represent the Optimists in Canterbury. Um, we do, we're an international organisation and the um, British and Great Britain and Ireland Federation has a consultative status of the United Nations Economic Social Council. We constantly lobby on issues like human trafficking, violence against women, and although we don't get immediate answers, we never give up. We never give up because we know that one day we will get some success, and I believe the same will happen with COP. And just picking up quickly on what Carl said about India, I don't know how many people watch the Earthshot Awards, 
but there was a young lady who had an iron card in the project. Now I was privileged to hear the very first webinar she did on that. And this young lady at the age of 14 came home from school, saw this ironing cart burning all this charcoal and was so distressed that she went home and designed a, an ironing cart with solar panels. And I had the opportunity to ask her a question. I said, I hope you're going to be able to roll this out further than Calcutta. She said, yes, I plan to take it to Mumbai. And I was delighted to see this young lady being able to be put forward. She, although she didn't get the award, she was there. That was the important thing. And I think supporting Ella and all she's doing is the future, it's the younger people that we've got to think about. And I'm hoping, as the lady who lived in Australia said, eventually, by leading by example, other countries will follow suit. And that is my hope and dream for COP. And I'll be doing my best to not be anybody I can talk to, I can assure you. Thank you. Thank you, I know there's more questions, but I'm going to have to draw to a close.